God. <laughs> As you can tell, Bird has a love-hate relationship with his neighbor. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I can't do anything over there. His house is higher up on the, on the corner than mine, so he, he looks down over me all the time. <laughs> I, I, oh, Jesus. That's I keep scary. an eye on the that's, front. That's a very scary thought. Yes, sir, it is very scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so you've been dealing with the VA for since, since you got... When did you get out of the service, anyway? Uh, 1968. Okay, so you got out when I graduated from uh, from college. That was the big year, you know, the big yep. all the anti-Vietnam stuff was going on. Yeah, big deal. You know, Maybe I, you know, Jane Fonda made her great statements, and yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. It it is what it is, and it was what it was. I volunteered to go to Vietnam, and I thought it was the right thing to do. And it didn't take too long to realize that uh, it was one of the biggest mistakes of my life. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because I had, uh, I was, uh, I went to medical school. So to, uh, officially you get a, you get a uh, deferment for that. But I was going to sign up for the Navy and I had friends who said, don't do it. Just don't do it. Well, in of course, hindsight, they were absolutely correct. But I think there were a lot of people that at the time, they didn't want to be sent. They didn't want to be drafted. I was already in the service when I volunteered to go. Um, I was actually in the Coast Guard. That was my unit. Of course, the Coast Guard came under the Department of Navy, time of war. So I not only was on a, a 82-foot river patrol craft and the first line of defense in the oceans, uh, I was also uh, underwater demolition with the Navy. So, um, so you were a diver? Yes. Pretty uh, scary. Pretty yeah. scary. See, that's what I would have done. I love diving. So yeah. I, would, I would have jumped into the probably the submarine program or something, uh, some crazy thing like that. Who knows? Yeah. But anyway, the, I guess the big question is what... Uh, you or your experience with the VA, I guess, is what we're supposed to talk about. Uh, and I, 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 you know, mine is very limited, but I've, I've worked in several VA hospitals, but I have no experience with the uh, bureaucracy uh, trying to get help from the VA, uh, with the exception of my father, who's a World War II veteran, and he's... Um, I think he tried to get help um, for his for his wife's home care and had no help whatsoever. Just just one delay after another. So my mother's home care was was what he was trying to get help with. I see. But, but that's the only thing I know uh, from the patient point of view. So yeah, I'm curious about your your experience. Well, I'll be quite frank, and the easiest way for me to start is to tell you that. I had actually stopped even seeking help after my first heart attack. My first heart attack, I was taking one drug, Lipitor, and I went from one drug to probably six immediately. In a year to the day, I had my second heart attack, uh, a blockage on the backside of the heart, which was a much smaller blood vessel. The first one was very severe. So when I saw how many drugs I was going to go on and what the cost was, I said to myself, well, I might as well go to the VA. Maybe they'll help me. Up to that point, I figured in my own mind, there were too many war vets that came back from Vietnam and Korea and all the other places, uh, Desert Storm, whatever, that were very severely injured, that needed the money a lot more than I did. Well, I was told by numerous people within the VA, especially the nurses and the doctors, that that was a major mistake on my part, that I should have any problem that I had. I should have approached the VA immediately. Um, so I said, well, that's just the way I feel. I still feel the same way. I'm still at a point where sometimes uh, yesterday, two days ago, I went out in a, um, I have extensive pain. In my, I have three crushed vertebrae in my lower spine. And one knee and both hips are driving me crazy. <laughs> Excuse me. I had a doctor who had had eight surgeries on his back 
So he was in charge of the pain management part of the clinic. And this man knew everything about pain that there was to know. And we could relate because of the excruciating pain that I've had all my life. Uh, the reason for bringing it up, two days ago, I met my new doctor. Um, and she, um, I got talking to her about this TIMS unit that, that sends out the small amounts of electricity. Yeah. And uh, she said, well, we have them. We, I can surely send you down to the physical therapy and let you talk to the, the uh, doctor down there, the doctor of therapy. And I went down and talked to him, and he says, I think you're a candidate for this. And I had seen in the grocery stores some of the cheaper ones. Well, this one's pretty elaborate. It has, it's all digital, it's computerized, it has three different uh, phases to it. And uh, so we went through the whole thing, and he put it on me on my back. And uh, yesterday was our grocery day. And when I'm carrying the groceries in, I'll go from one on the pain level, I'll go to ten immediately. As soon as I pick up all the big grocery bags, there's just something about it. Like when I do dishes, it's the simplest thing, but my back bending over that sink doing dishes, I'll stand there and cry while I do the dishes. I will not stop doing them. That's just my job. But anyhow, the, the, the TINS unit works. And I was very, very impressed. And I said to the, the doctor, I said, I, I know that I shouldn't be this greedy, but I have three parts of my body that I have excruciating pain, my back being the worst, uh, the one knee and the both hips, probably seven or eight on the pain scale. I said, do you ever consider giving out two of these units? He said, you know, that's funny. He said, I've never had anybody ask me that. I said, well, I hesitate because I don't want to take something away from somebody else. So he told me how to go about it. He said, wait two weeks or two months. He said, call up, say it was in your luggage and the airlines lost your luggage or something else. He said, we'll send you another unit. Well, I don't know if I'll, I'll pursue that or not. <clears throat> I may go to the, the drugstore and buy a, a $40 one. Uh, just, I just, I don't like to do that to the VA because then at some point, you know, some veteran might come in that really needs it and they don't have any. So, uh, but working with the VA, I, um, I had given up completely and, uh, I still had gotten, I was allowed to get drugs from the VA after my heart attack, but it was, there was a lot to do with my income level. This all had to be filled out and notarized. And then after it was all said and done, I would have to pay a certain dollar amount for these drugs because, uh, as you may or may not know, the VA goes from, they classify you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think they might have eliminated nine and gone eight, meaning that, uh, fine, you're a veteran, you're in a war, uh, you're welcome to come here. We will prescribe your drugs, in which case uh, your copayment might be $50, $60 for one given drug for a, a maintenance period of 90 days. And then they would turn around and bill my insurance company. But uh, now I'm actually 60% disabled, uh, stomach heart disease, which I've already discussed with you, and I also have post-traumatic stress. So that they gave me 30 and 30, which is 60. Of course, in the eyes of the VA, that's only 50%. They automatically take 10% off the top. Just another gimmick. But the, the gentleman that finally got me hooked up with the VA uh, knew exactly what he was doing. He called me out of the clear blue sky. I'd given up. It had been two and a half years of attempting to break into this system where they would actually pay for some of my drugs. And um, I filled out all the paperwork. A cardiologist filled out paperwork that stated I was non-employable. Well, actually, I had taken it at the age of 60. Uh, the company bridged me to 62, so I, I retired from one of the greatest jobs that anybody could ever have. I mean, I just, you know, it, it was just wonderful. Sometimes you had to pinch yourself because they were paying me to do what I did. And I'll tell you, I, they paid me because I was good and I was fast and I had contacts. You know, if something major happening place, I had to be there yesterday before it happened. 
but because of the military and the people that I'd met, I was able to get on military aircraft in a lot of cases and go, where a lot of your other photographers were trying to fly in commercial and stuff like that. But anyhow, uh, I had given up for at least two and a half years and decided that I'm just of course, realizing I had post-traumatic stress, which wasn't diagnosed through them, but I knew something was wrong my whole life. My God. I mean, I'm, I'm generally, I'm a nice person, but within one or two seconds, I can be the meanest son of a bitch you've ever met in your life. And I, even physically, um, I was trained to kill in, in Vietnam, and that's basically what you did. Scared to death, guaranteed. But I killed because I didn't want to be killed myself. So all the fear and everything else. But getting back to two and a half years that I had given up, I said, the only way to break this nutshell, and I'm not even sure it can be done, I went through Monroe County here. They have a, a, a panel of three or four people that are in place in our county to help the vets. I went to them. I, I got no satisfaction whatsoever. They would help me fill out a form or something like that, and then I'd send it in. Of course, it'd be denied, and then uh, you're allowed to challenge once. Right. And uh, I'd go back to him, and I'd say, oh, yeah, we can't challenge, absolutely. So we would challenge it. You know, six, seven, eight months later, it would come back denied. So their answer was, you're going to have to get an attorney, a lawyer. I said, well, I'm not willing to do that. I mean, I can pay for my own drugs. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to screw around with it. So that's where I was. Sitting in my living room or in my family room one day, and we monitor all of our calls through an answering machine. And my answering machine has the screwiest message on you ever. Most people won't even sit there and listen to it intentionally. You know, it's like I'm out in the barn working on the helicopter because uh, my wife just gave me a great big long honey-do list to do. And I, I got to get the new wheels in this helicopter. I can't go do the honey-do list. Well, people selling shit, they ain't going to listen to this. And you hear click halfway through it. So, so why I picked up the phone, the day that this phone rang, I can't tell you. God was watching over me is what happened. I, there's no doubt. I got a phone call from a guy, and he says, Mr. Lewis. I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, this is Gordon such and such from the VA in Buffalo. Yeah. I said, how can I help you, sir? Very negatively. I mean, I just... I had no time for him, and um, he said, well, I'm with the compensation board. Now he's got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> compensation board, really? He no, said, more. He said, I've got to ask you, he said, we requested two and a half years ago a very simple document signed by your cardiologist stating that you were unemployable. I said, yes. He said, why didn't you send it in? I said, I did send it in. He said, where'd you send it? I said, I sent it to rapid response, where I was told to send it, rapid response, outside of, uh, someplace outside of Washington, D.C. And he says, oh, Jesus. He said, I'll, I can never retrieve it from him. It was a private company hired by the government to expedite claims and get the VA, get the veterans into the system. So we him a hard and I said, I, still, I said, sir, I can't believe you're with the VA in Buffalo. Why in the hell did you call me? I've given up on you. I gave up on you two and a half years ago. He says, well, here's my story. He said, I was a command master sergeant in the Army. That's God. I mean, it is God. <laughs> and he said, I, 28 years I was there. He said, I've been with the VA in Buffalo for 18 years. I'm retiring in a, actually a year and a 18 months, I guess, if you're going to retire. He said, so anything I can do for you, we're going to get done. We're going to get it done now because I won't be here to help you. And he says, I'm going to give you wisdom and guidance because I've been on both sides of the comp board. I've been on the, the, the panel that recommends the percentages that the other side of the comp board stated, yes, this gentleman does definitely qualify for some kind of medical help and some kind of a uh, uh, a monthly sum of money to make you know to benefit him. So uh, okay, fine. He says I sat on both sides. He says right now I'm not on the comp board, 
He says, but I sit right here with them. He said, I'm in charge of reading through all these. I just, like yours. And I saw two and a half years had passed. And he said, I just couldn't imagine why you didn't send us the paperwork. So I said, well, I did send it. He said, do you have a copy of it? I said, sure, I have a copy of it. So I came over to John's house because I didn't have a fax machine. And one problem with the VA is that, first of all, the first problem you have is contacting a live human person to talk to. It's almost impossible in the, in the VA system. So I came over to John's and I sent the uh, copy of the, uh, or faxed it up. The guy calls me back in the afternoon, the same day. I said, what is this? Who are you? I mean, I was just, I was dumbfounded. So he said, well, he said, um, I got it. It's quite evident that it's dated. And he said, um, I'll give you a call tomorrow morning. I said, really? You're going to call me back tomorrow morning? I said, I haven't been able to get a hold of anyone in the VA for years, even automated systems. He calls me back the following morning. He says, you just got 30% for a stomach heart disease. 18 hours later, that's what he did for me. And I, I, I didn't know how to thank the man. So while we're on the phone, now you have to understand, this man was in control. He was in a seat. He was God as far as a veteran would. Because he's sitting there on the comp board. So the next thing he did, um, he says, how about post-traumatic stress? I says, don't even go there. I says, I've had it all my life. I said, it's, it's horrendous. It's terrible. Uh, I said, but I don't even want to talk about it. I said, he said, I want to set up an appointment in Rochester for you to a psychologist. I said, I want nothing to do with it. You're not listening to me. Now he had a plan. He knew exactly what he was doing. So, uh, well, he said, I can't, I just, God, I've got to set up an appointment for you. I said, I, I won't go. I said, I just, I will not sit and talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist about the war. The war was a horrendous thing. It was a terrible, terrible thing that I killed many, many people in the name of our damn country. And I said it was wrong. So uh, he said, okay, fine. Next morning, quarter after eight, the phone rings. It's him. He said, I made an appointment for you uh, this coming Thursday at the VA. I says, I told you I didn't want anything to do with this. Well, this what he was trying to do, he knew that 50% disability was the secret number. Once you are 50% disabled, the VA is obligated to pay for everything medically except for dental. Uh, dental, I don't know why the dental doesn't enter into that. So anyhow, he, we talked for about 45 minutes. So I went. I spent two and a half hours with a psychologist, crying, tears running down my face. It just, it opened up Pandora's box. Exactly what I was afraid was going to happen. So anyhow, um, I said to the psychologist, what do you think, Doc? He says, oh, he says, you got post-traumatic stress. There's no doubt about that. I says, you haven't seen anything. I said, you ought to see me in action sometime. <laughs> so um, came back home. Gordon called me up that afternoon. He said, you went to the appointment. He said, I have all the records right here in front of me already. I said, you've got to be kidding me. This, this man is like God. So um, he said, now, there's one more thing I ask you to do, which is all part of the process. He said, I'm here for you. I've got your foot in the door. And I want to make sure that you get 50% out of this. And in order to get 50, you have to have 60. So in order to give me 30 for the uh, semi heart disease, and he wanted to get me 30 for post-traumatic stress, which he eventually did do. So um, he called me back the following morning. He says, there's one more step. And he says, I know you're not going to like it. He said, I'm going to schedule an appointment with a psychiatrist in Rochester. Turned out to be a woman. I can't remember her name. And I went. And before we ever sat down, I said, ma'am, I said, here's the situation. She says, I've heard it before, before you even open your mouth. I says, no, you didn't. I said, I was in that room with that psychologist 
I said, I was crying. I was bringing up terrible memories. When I went home that night, I, I just, I, I can't tell you what my, was going on in my head, in my subconscious. He said, I know all about it. He said, but you, this psychiatrist wants to talk to you. It's not going to be anywhere as near as in depth because the psychologist already has turned over all his records to her. So I said to her, I said, she said, I'm not, I will not put you through that again. She said, but I want to elaborate on a few of this, this areas that, in fact, the psychologist talked to you about. I said, all right, I'm willing to do that. But I said, Doc, I said, if, if I reach a point where I'm falling into this, this deep, dark hole like I did two days ago with a psychologist, I said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk out. There's not enough money in the world to make me have to live through that again. So she was pretty gentle with me. And um, so I guess it was two days later, Gordon from Buffalo calls me. He says, well, I got all your records from the psychiatrist. I says, it's amazing how fast you people are really getting to get, getting shit together here. I said, I went years and years and years, never even could get a hold of anybody. He says, okay, just bear with me. He said, it is done. You, as far as post-traumatic stress, you do have it. He said, now, I recommend to the comp board that I have a veteran, which is you, and how severe you have it, according to all the records. And so he said, I came up with 30%. That's what I'm going to recommend on my paperwork that I'm sending to the guy next to me sitting in the desk. <laughs> all right, that sounds all right to me. So now it's quite evident to me that this guy is God. I mean, he's, he's got a hold of somebody that's been really screwed over as far as the VA and left, just left blowing in the wind. And he, he never actually came out and said, I have a, you know, an idea of what I want to do, but he had a, an agenda. So here again, I come over to John's house. I had all eight questions. John faxed it up for me. It was about three days later. He calls me up and says, you got 30% disability for post-traumatic stress. Now, not that the money's that important, but that's about $1,000 a month of stifles from the VA for 50%. Uh, but he got me what he knew I needed to get total coverage through the VA at no cost to myself because I had 50%. Uh, I won't tell you how many boxes <laughs> of, uh, uh, what's the name of the state company? The, uh, oh, 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 oh. Anyhow, there's a company that sends literature out all the time. They ship steaks and stuff all over the Omaha steaks. Omaha steaks. I sent him three different boxes, and before I'd send them, I'd call him at the VA, and he'd answer. I said, you're not going out of town this weekend, are you? Well, no. Why do you ask? I says, well, something's coming to your front door, and I said, it's going to be in a in a, a container with, you know, dry ice. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. So over the one was over the holidays. So I sent him three different packages. There was no way that I could thank this man for what he had done for me. And it was just sheer, stupid, dumb luck because I was done. I was never going to approach the VA again. And that's pretty much my story. I still sit at 50%. The VA is uh, doing everything for me except for dental. And you have to be, had to have been a prisoner of war or uh, there's, there's another criteria I don't know. And that's my story. And if this man had not found that piece of paperwork, I would still be paying for my own bills through my own general practitioner. And I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of veterans out there that are in the same situation that don't have or won't have this Gordon, who is now retired, give a call and help them out. They're, the least they're going to have to do is, is get an attorney because the government is, is just is so screwed up to begin with um, that – my thought is, is that I don't know that it's intentional that they put the veterans through this to try to save money or if it's just the bureaucracy and it is so screwed up that every these vets just fall between the cracks. I personally think my, my own gut feeling is is that uh, they don't give a shit about the vets. They never did. Well, look what, look what Obama did. When Obama first, first tour. He goes on television with a press conference and says, you know, I think we, we should make our men and women that are fighting in these wars pay some portion of their insurance, their health insurance. <laughs> it lasted one day. 
The following day, he retracted the statement, said that was one of the biggest thing, biggest problems, the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life. <laughs> but that tells you what the mindset. With the mindset of the people in Washington or the Defense Department, and I'm convinced that that is absolutely where we stand right now today. I'm just one that I can tell you that I was extremely fortunate um, to have gotten into this, this system through this Gordon because I refused to hire an attorney, and that's what it was going to take. And uh, I'll do anything for a vet. I don't. I mean, if monetary. John knows. I, I give money to people, and I'm not a wealthy person. But I, I just absolutely would do anything for anybody. But come to a vet. If I know a vet that needs money or his family's hurting, I'm right there in the doorstep. I'm a firm believer in giving one on one, so that nobody is going to step in and take seventy or eighty percent of the money and give somebody else twenty or thirty percent of it. And I still do it. I, did, I just did it down at the ocean. That is, uh, I I think I don't know what John told you uh, so far about what we're trying to do, but basically he has described it an outline as to what you're trying to. Anything that helps. I don't care what you're trying to do. <laughs> yeah, what's your perspective? My perspective is pretty straightforward. Um, I've been doing medicine for 40 years, and it's always been personalized, one-on-one -on -one care, and I do what the person in front of me needs. So it doesn't matter who pays for it or not. Uh, and sometimes I get in trouble because I do what I'm supposed to do for the patient. Yep. Shame on you. I know. I know. It's unbelievable. What are you, a heretic? You wore that white coat for a reason. <laughs> yeah. and, well, God bless you for doing what you do. And, and then, you know, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, a, a bunch of us got together and decided, uh, realized that we couldn't make things better from the inside. So we were going to set up a for-profit corporation to try to fix things from the outside. And then a few years ago, 2013, we decided it'd be better if we were a nonprofit. So that's what Veritas Healthcare is. Basically, it's trying to uh, move that kind of thinking into an institutional level to do whatever it takes to fix the problems with health and healthcare. So, well, thank what, God. That's what our plan is. And we were originally going to try to do set up some cooperatives. It's still part of the mission uh, to set up cooperative action plans and uh, actual patient-physician co-ops as a part of the solution. So it has to operate outside of the business of medicine and the government. So that's right. th these are the fundamental principles that you can't change these monsters. So you have to operate outside of them. And... And the idea is that the people who need the care would be the owners. They'd be the owners and the users. Right. So the, the patients and the physicians and the providers and everybody who has something to give and something to get out of it would all be owners, equal owners, no bosses. So the, I, this vast concept came along, this vast net came along because we – identified veterans as a, a, a highly motivated uh, group that's underserved. And uh, Sharita, who hasn't, who's not here yet, but I think she's going to come in. Maybe, maybe she isn't. But she said she was going to come in uh, today to this, but I don't know. Maybe she didn't find the right invitation. But in any case, she's a vet who I met with in Florida. Uh, she was sent to me through one of my um, contacts through Veritas Healthcare. And so we just talked about what, what you know, what can, what can I do to help you in essence is what, it, is what, what it boiled down to. And she told me what she wants to do. And then John hooked me up with Jesse and now he's bringing me to you. So that's where we are. We're, we're really trying to set up this network of people to help each other to get the 
uh, health and health care that they need. And well, that, God bless you, and I, I, I can't thank you enough. No matter what the outcome is, keep in the back of your mind that I had done everything that I was supposed to have done, paperwork-wise, signature-wise, notary, everything, and I sent it to the right place, which was a private organization, institution called Rapid Response, hired by the government to speed up the whole process. And Gordon in Buffalo said, it's, it is absolutely just a money-making thing for some company. Yeah, you know, it's, it exactly. hindered us. So I think keeping that's, that's the point. If, it's, if we, if we yeah. set up a business that's designed to help the people who want the help, and it's owned by the people who want the help, and everything is transparent, and if you make any money, it goes back to the people who actually own the company, who are the people who need the help, then it's kind of hard to be a crook. That's correct. So I, I believe in transparency. And I, I mean, you know, people, even people who mean well screw up some of the time. So they, everyone uh, needs to operate under the same principles. And yes. And uh, and not be afraid of, of being watched because to me it's very straightforward. You follow the money, and if the money's going in the wrong places, uh, absolutely, you fix it. Yep, that's correct. So, well, I agree with I agree with everything that we talked about so far, and and the the veterans, male and female, both need more advocates like you and John and the other people that you've spoken about because. It's not, they're not going to be able to do it. They, well, it's quite evident. And this isn't the last war we're going to have. Uh, they can't do it on their own. They need help, and they need help from a neutral, you know, perspective of a neutral area that is not government control or, right. or hired by the government because it's not going to work. Uh, what you're pro saying, hey, it sounds great. And you know, you, I can't, there's, there's no numbers, but it's got to be thousands and thousands and thousands of veterans, male and female both, that are, are sitting someplace in chair right now saying, God, this is great. I hope this gets off the ground because they've, they've just hit a brick wall, just like, just as I did. Right, right. Well, I think this is not a, this, this is a universal problem in healthcare. I think the veterans are, are particularly identifiable group which makes it relatively easy to focus on right. if we can solve the problem what I'm saying is if we can solve the problem for one veteran at a time then we can and and their families then we can solve the problem for the rest of the people who need health and health care everywhere else on this planet you know you're right so yeah. I think it's an opportunity to make a model that actually works because it's a group of highly motivated people. I mean, these are, um, and, and a lot of them have time, uh, and, and they may not have health, but they have time. And, and if they have that, then they have a lot to contribute. So I see. Well, <laughs> if, we, if we sick John on anybody, for whatever reason, you better run and hide because that guy, he, ain't, he just ain't going to stop looking. <laughs> what the world needs now is love, sweet love. God, he's crazy, honest to God. <laughs> That's all right. But we're going to put his madness to work. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Maybe I ought to get a house above his so I can look down on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, the concept, sir as far as I'm concerned, is marvelous. Um, uh, I, I, I'll help you in any way that can possibly help you. I, I just, I feel that strongly. Not only the veterans, I mean anybody that's in need. I, you know, being a photographer with the largest newspaper chain in the world, I mean, I did stories better to the derelicts, to the, the homeless who were legitimately homeless, you know, that might have been a, a corporate person, and they just, there was no family to help them out, and they were living on the streets. I would treat them the same way that I would treat you or John or anybody else. Because if I approached my photo shoot, which may have been five or six or seven photographs to tell the story, if I approached them on the wrong level, like, Jesus, look at you, you know, I, I'm making big money up here, you know, traveling all over, shooting all these great jobs. I, I couldn't, 
I wasn't able to show what the story was trying to tell. I have to approach on their level. And just to correct one thing, John apparently is impressed with the fact that I photographed the presidents, kings, queens, uh, Lady Di, all the presidents except for Nixon. The truth of the matter is, it doesn't mean a damn thing to me. I don't care. It was a photo shoot. It was a, I was directed to do this. I was sent. They paid me to fly here, there, there. That doesn't matter. Movie stars, there are people going, oh my God, you photographed John Wayne? No. Elvis Presley? No. I photographed them all. But those were assignments to me. They were sent to me to go shoot. And, and it, it impresses the hell out of John because I w was there with these people. Okay, that's fine. But I was doing a job. And uh, people say, what, what's the best photograph you ever took? I said, I haven't taken it yet. But to leave this stigma that, oh, my God, i got to go photograph the President of the United States. Holy shit, what am I going to do? Uh-uh, it's not the way it works. When I walk into the office of the CEO of Kodak here in Rochester, his voice, his mouthpiece, his secretary walks right in behind me. She says, you're going to have 17 minutes. You have a half hour now to set up. 17 minutes. 17 minutes, clock, he's gone. And you see those doors over there on the top of that tower that open onto that small gateway, the little walkway around the top of the tower, the corporate. She says, under no circumstances is that man supposed to go out there. It was a natural photograph. <laughs> because the whole city backdrop, he was on the 18th, 19th, 20th floor, the whole city backdrop was behind him. Look, okay, yes, ma'am, anything you say. She left the room, came in, I walked over to the door, and he says, you want me to go out there? He says, I'm like a shot. I said, you bet, sir, as long as it's your idea. <laughs> oh, he said, she got to you already, didn't she? I says, Oh, okay. We pushed the wrong button there. Uh, okay. So uh, I went out there and I, sh I shot the picture and he left and she chewed my ass out like you wouldn't believe. Uh, but I got the picture I wanted. Yeah, I, I, I've done many stories uh, on children and and I mean really in-depth stories where I might follow them for a year. Uh, the child had some strange disease or cancer, knowing full well they were going to die. Uh, and I would go down and meet with them wherever they were, wherever the assignment was, and I'd lay on the floor, roll around with them and the mother and father, and I was down there laying on the floor for shooting pictures and everything else, and then when the child would pass, then we would put the package together and we'd do the story and try to tell the story in such a way that it benefited anybody that would read it. But uh, these were the stories that were important to me. I mean, I've covered plane crashes, shipwrecks, I mean, everything you can humanly imagine. Major fires where uh, 20, 30, 40 people would burn to death. And I don't know. It's it's not the famous how famous the people were because I operated the same way. I approached the President of the United States when I was going to photograph him. Exactly the same way that if I was invited into your home, and we were doing a story on a specific thing that you did and did extremely well, I would talk to you for a short period of time, and I'd ask a lot of questions because the answers that I would, get, would be getting from you would absolutely lead as to how I was going to photograph you or what environment I was going to put you into to photograph you. But uh, famous people, most of them are a pain in the ass. But, well, what I mean, amazing. really, seriously. What amazed me, though, was the assignment when the Attica uprising, uh, where Burr had uh, special dispensation uh, that overruled the warden, and he got into areas that nobody else ever would have gotten in to see at Attica. I went to, uh, Gannett decided they were going to, I was at Attica for the whole insurrection. And Gannett decided that after it all came down and all the investigations were starting to take place, the prisoners were right. They were they were not lying. The prisoners were being fed pasta and all kinds of shit every day. And it was a major, uh, Attica is a, a really bad prison. You know, if you're going to Attica, you're, you've done something really, really bad. 
but um, they decided to do a book after the six months after the uh, riot at Attica. They gave me the project of going to all the prisons in New York State with a letter from the uh, administrative prisons, uh, the superintendent of prisons, that uh, I was to be accepted and I was to be allowed to photograph anything, anywhere. And we went down to Rikers Island. I walked up, showed them the letter. They knew I was coming. A lieutenant, an officer with a guard, spent probably four or five hours that day with me. We went around. Came to lunchtime. He says, come on, we'll get down to the officer's mess. We had steak. So, next day I go in, have a different officer. And there were a lot of other things I wanted. I had questions, and we'd go there, look there. Um, we go back. He's come. It's lunchtime. We're going back to the officer's mess. We had steak again. Two days in a row, the officers were eating steak. And the prisoners were eating nothing but pasta. And this was one of their big bitches at Attica. And the fact that it was overcrowded. So, this was one hell of a story. I started my career here in Rochester at Attica. And do you know I retired in 19 or 2005? Attica cases were still in the courts. The guards have never been settled. It's the most extraordinary, typical government bullshit that anybody could ever possibly imagine. And in my, when I had my uh, retirement, all the TV stations came and then they come to the house and I, I have many hundreds of mounted prints of things that I felt were important, like maybe a president or maybe an actor or actress. And they're all pristine, mounted on black mount board. It was, it was natural for the TV stations because here I have all these, these things I can show them while we're talking. And uh, you're talking about Attica and... Uh, to think that it's still in the courts now, today, all of it hasn't been settled. So well, anyhow, I uh, I just wanted to make sure you, it, it wasn't the necessarily the. It, it's nice, you know, who the most the, the the greatest person and a person that I have so much respect for, and I wish that I could meet with him again, the Dalai Lama. Well, I think you can nope. help us. You can help us because because of your uh, passion for photography. You can certainly help us tell the story. And I think the Dalai Lama is an important part of this, but John would probably harass me about it. But I think <laughs> the message the message is simple. It's all about cooperation. Yes. It's all about the love. Exactly. It's altruism, <laughs> altruism and, and brotherly love. That's absolutely true. So that's great that you got to meet the man. You know how lucky you are you don't live next to this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, <laughs> I, I deal with him every day. Yes, I can't imagine. I can't, does, does, he, does he come over and harass you often? Uh, yeah, we have a bar set up out in the sheds, and the sheds are all he all heated. So even at the worst, there could be a blizzard outside. We're sure we're sitting in the shed. It's nice and warm, drinking scotch. Sure, he stops over once in a while. He's drinking the rot gut scotch, and I'm drinking the, uh, uh, the yeah. apple. It's apple moonshine is what he's got going, and he hates it. But I say, hey, it's delicious. I'll assist. <laughs> this man will not drink an average bottle of scotch. It sits on top of the refrigerator in that shed. And as soon as he comes in the damn shed door, that's what I drink. I, I'll drink the real good stuff, but I'll buy it. And then I, I think I'll save it for a special occasion. I got like 70 or 80 bottles of scotch over there that are probably, I don't know, every $75, $80 a bottle. I don't drink them. But he comes over and he, he's looking all, you, you don't know what these sheds are. There's so much shit in these sheds. And he's always looking around. For Lagavulin or something. No, you like got to find the best one. <laughs> Lagavulin. He won't buy Lagavulin for himself. He'll buy a $50 bottle, but he won't buy Lagavulin. So I get that at Christmas and birthdays. <laughs> well, you, you, you're very fortunate to have a good guy like this living next to you. I don't know why he puts up with you, John. Because he loves me. <laughs> <laughs> He never quits. It never ends. 
<laughs> I am very fortunate, and I, I'm not ashamed to say it. I met John. We knew the house was for sale. I intentionally got in the car, and they're just two big corner lots. I got one, he's, and I went all the way down the cul-de-sac, and I came back up, and he was just coming out of the driveway. And I stopped the car. Of course, I'm a very outgoing person. I mean, I was a photographer, and I'm just part of my, you know, demeanor. I rolled the window down, and I said, how are you, sir? I'm fine. I said, did you buy the house? He says, we did. I said, do you drink scotch? <laughs> He, he never, he, first time he's ever met me. He says, oh, I've been known to have a bottle or two. Well, that's where our relationship started. <laughs> well, and before that, though, what he, I said, my name's John Hoban, and he goes, I'm Burr Lewis. And I said, Burr, as in Aaron Burr, oh, the duel with Alexander Hamilton? He goes, yes, sir, that was my great, 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 great grandfather. <laughs> that was the initial meeting. You serious? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have his, we have his cradle, and some of his silverware. But some of the other family members also have some of the silverware. Heck, so I, I, deal. I'd never heard anybody named uh, after Aaron Burr, so I thought it was quite historic. It is. Yeah, it was. It's historic, all right. <laughs> it certainly is. Whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> all I know is I'm a pretty damn good shot. Apparently, Burr was too. <laughs> At least, at least Hamilton didn't didn't think so. <laughs> no, I, I like I said, I commend you folks for doing what you're trying to do. And if there's anything I can do to help you get it off the floor, I hands down, absolutely. I don't know what it would be. Well, that's, I'm not a, you know, that's intelligent great. like the main thing right now is we're just building a community. So, is there anything we can do to help you? Actually, I'm in the system now. Yeah. I appreciate it greatly. Um, the system, once you're in it, is a little slow, but I I don't know of anything that I've requested that they didn't at least look at and uh, try to decide should he have this or shouldn't he have it. They've been very outgoing. So, uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, would I like to have 100% disability? Yes, I certainly would, but I'm not, you know, I don't want to go there. I'll take the 50% because it's, in essence, giving me an extra thousand dollars a month, totally tax free. And that to me is important. Um, so I appreciate your offer, but right now I'm in the door and you're, what you have to do is seek out the people who are having the problems, you know, breaking down this damn barricade. Because like I said, I think, I think a lot of it's intentional. I think the government, in fact, I'm positive of it, I, I, I've done enough work with the government and everything else, that they intentionally throw these roadblocks in front of you, figuring we'll wear them down, and they'll just plain stop asking. Right. And I'm sure you've, you've seen it on television. You've seen guys that have lost their legs and their arms, and, you know, the prosthetics are out there, some of the greatest prosthetics in the world. And unless you really know somebody or you get some law firm behind your back, you're not going to get them. And boy, that's not right. That's not right. No, I, I would give I would give up all my VA, the money, the drugs, everything, if I could help somebody else who has lost an arm or a leg or something like that get that fixture that they need. Because right. hand down, they shouldn't be denied. They know they were in a war. They know he was in an armored car, a tank or whatever, and it was blown up. They know everything about it. Why would you think? You know, that there was any reason in the world not to put that man back to 70, 80, 90 percent of what he was before he was blown up, if we have the technology. It should, it should be just hands down done. Exactly. But it, exactly. There's, there's too damn many politicians involved, too many, you know, fingers in a pot. Right. And they, well, they're spending, they're throwing away lots of money. So, um, I think that's the, exactly the point, is how do we get the allocation of resources uh, to the right places to get the jobs done. So um, uh, if you can join us, I'm going to just assume that you're going to join the group, and this is the beginning. So I don't know about uh, technology and how tech savvy you are or whether you care about it or not, but... Um, 
What I was going to do is just add you to our base camp group. And I don't know if John can probably help you um, navigate. If Yeah. The, uh, I'm getting a lot of complaints on the amount of volume. So I'll be his filter. Okay. And when something comes through, I'll, I'll forward it over to Burr. All right. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's the way it works so that people don't have to be there to physically to have meetings. The right. idea is that. You get an email anytime something's posted, and you can either respond to the email or not. So it some people like it, and some don't. Um, and if John wants to be your your filter, if that's good with you, that's fine. Sure, that's fine. Let me ask you a question. What are your feelings uh, for the Disabled Veterans of America, DAV? Have you had any contact with them at all? I have not. I'm I'm more, I'm letting the veterans take the lead on on the veteran organizations. That I think Sharita has a relationship, so or, or Jesse, one of the two of them are working with DAV. Yeah. Well, because I don't know. Yes, I don't know what each person is connect. Uh, what organizations each person is connected to, but our idea is to work with one veteran at a time, and then. Yes. Uh, if if they if that particular person thinks we should be working with a, an organization and adding some other dimension to our work, then that's great. We should just talk about it. And, um, right. Well, what, what no, it's just a question. I, I I've heard. I was a little leery. I joined. I'm a lifetime member. Um, I just I read all their, their stuff that they send out and the fact that they go to. You know, they go to all these, uh, to the Senate and stuff like this and listen to the, you know, some of the bills that are trying to be passed. And they also get a hold of their guys and try to get some of this stuff introduced. Um, and the more I talk to people, the more I think that uh, at least some of the veterans are starting to turn to this organization opposed to hiring an attorney. <coughs> because this organization apparently, well, of course, they say that they do. Uh, they have a couple of departments with people specifically trained and also have the power and insight on whom to call to try to get over some of these hurdles, which would be a wonderful thing. Uh, I think that's great. What I'd like to do is, is help people to connect to any organization that can help. So uh, I don't know who can do what in the VA system. I only know the little bit that each person tells me yes. about their experience and <laughs> good and bad. And I, my personal experience is that people who actually get in, and this is as a provider, as I'm watching it and providing services in the VA hospitals over, over the last 30, 40 years, I've seen that the care is good, so I don't. I, it's slow, but it's good. So I, I agree. I don't know. I don't. I think the pro, the obstacles are outside of the hospital, and 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 I'm not exactly sure where they are, but uh, I think they can be um, they can be either fixed or removed or gone around. Right. <laughs> There's, there's a way to there's a way to deal with it, and uh, I think that's good. Let's do it. This is this is not it's not much different from the rest of the healthcare system, as I said. So the obstacles right. are different, but uh, uh, we have to we have to do the right thing every minute of every day. There are no other options. Well, thank God there's people like you and John out there, and the other people that you were talking about today, because. Um, it needs to be fixed. It needs to be addressed. And the government's not going to address it because I think, in all sincerity, I think they are intentionally causing a lot of the, a lot of the problems that are out there. Just hoping that they're going to drop out. Well, I know they did. I dropped out. I said, the hell with it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then I would have had to hire an attorney and pay him, what, 20, 25%? No. I just wasn't willing to do it. But that's not, the, it's just, that's not the bottom line. The bottom line is these people put up their lives for this country. Sometimes, erroneously, like just like Baghdad. I mean, it was just, 
Weapons of mass destruction. Isn't it awful funny that we never found any? But that was what they used as the criteria for going over and attacking that country. When we all know why we wanted, we wanted to be over there. We wanted to have a greater presence. We wanted to have air bases all over those oil fields. So we'll just say, eh, weapons of mass destruction. We know you got them. Never had them. Blatant lie. I mean, so. Oh, they had them. They moved them into Syria. Yeah, right. But it's our men and women that are being killed and blown up and, and ruined for life uh, for our government. And I'll tell you, it just makes me crawl. Because I saw it in Vietnam. There were targets of, uh, that we came across that were on the maps that were marked out in red. You couldn't go there. You couldn't touch them. The pilots couldn't bomb them. Now, we're fighting a war. We expect to win. Yeah, well, that's... You can tell I'm pretty tainted. Because just about every war we've been in, you know, we just, we're the muscle. we got to show the world. And, of course, look how much money the, 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 all the people in this country are making off a of war. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, uh, we're here. Good. We're gonna, Super. We're going to do what we can do. I commend you. Absolutely. And, God uh, bless. One step at a time. Uh, we we're we're just co building the community right now, so we're we're happy to have you. Good, thank you. I'm honored. I really am. I don't know, like I said, I don't know what I can do, but I'll anything I can do, I'll help you. Yeah, well, we'll figure that out. Okay. I'm gonna one say, day at a time. <laughs> one one day at a time, one step at a time. Yes, sir. It's been great. I really enjoyed the conversation. And it, it uh, leaves me with a good feeling knowing that somebody is trying to do something. And we, we are, we. Yes, I know. You're a part of we. <laughs> we the people. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we... Ciao for now, baby. All right. We'll talk to you later. I'll, t I'll talk to Sharita. I'll let her know. Take care, sir. We'll talk to you, and I'll talk to you guys about the the recording. I don't know what you want to do with it, but I got it. You okay with everything that was recorded? Absolutely. He's okay with everything that was recorded. All right. Well, we'll, we'll decide how we can share that, all right? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, buddy. Ciao for now. Ciao for now.